trends. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, why don't we stand as we prepare to worship? And just as we prepare to, to worship, um, just I think it, uh, the first few songs we have, I think, are just a great reminder of, I think it's easy to get overwhelmed sometimes by the times we're in and the things that are going on. At least it's easy for me to do that. Um, and these, these songs that we're about to sing are just, they're a good reminder for me at least of just um, what we, we have, have hope in, really. We have hope beyond what's just here in front of us, what's around us. We have something to look forward to, something that is promised to us. And we have a powerful king that we serve who overcomes it all and is in control of it all. So let's just remember those things as we sing this morning. All right. this song that just remind us that you are To, to see you as, as king in our lives. And I just thank you for this time that we can come together. I know not everybody um, around the world is able to do this right now, so we thank you for this opportunity. And I just uh, pray that you'll be well pleased with what you hear this morning. In your name I pray. Amen. You can be seated then. Father 
chosen. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. take off my face mask now? But you, you seen Tim, you seen Sean, and now, okay, all right, all right. We're, we're, we're not here for that, right? Okay. Amen. Worthy is the Lamb. I just love this church. We just like uh, this, this, uh, that smack talk sometimes. It just kind of gets us all light and, and joyful and happy, and uh, we should never forget that, especially, I mean, what I mean is being happy and joyful, because sometimes in the middle of crises, we get very uh, self-absorbed and we lose the joy, and we need to remember that. In fact, as I think about joy, it is certainly great to have Megan and Martin here this morning. Um, on Friday, there should be a lot of joy going on because they uh, intend to get married on Friday. So we're happy. That's a lot of joy. There. So let's continue to pray for them that God's glory would rest on their lives. Uh, let's have a word of prayer as we start. And I think I need to turn my mic on. Is that correct? Nope, I'm on. All right, super. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the grace of God that brings us salvation, that teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, and that we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. And so, Father, with, with humility, with brokenness, and yet with all love for you, we come before you, we take our Bibles and we open them up, and we invite your Holy Spirit to instruct us from your word. Help us to be different to worship you differently than when we came in. We thank you, Father, uh, in Jesus' good name. Amen. All right, we're going to uh, begin by looking at slide number 10. I think it's up there yet. Number 10, is that correct? Uh, oh, that's not number 10. Is that number 10? OK, I'm going to ask you to remove the slides, because I didn't save them properly then. <laughs> Uh, that's not number 10. Uh, that's not the one that I wanted. Um, we won't use the slides, so just uh, follow along as you can, as much as possible as we deal with the issue of the deity of Christ. Yes, as we deal with the issue of the deity of Christ. Um, yeah, there we go. We'll just keep that slide up there for a little bit as we walk our way through some of these thoughts. 
First of all, I want to just uh, express uh, some concern that some may have had last week when I made the statement, um, is there anything that could happen to me or you that would cause you to abandon your faith in Jesus? And I said, uh, if the, your answer is no, then you haven't been tested. And the point that I was trying to make there, and I want to be clear, uh, is uh, we don't truly know our own hearts. We don't truly understand what's in our heart. And so God took Abraham and Joseph and Job and Mary and others through testing to help them to see that they indeed remained faithful and trusted Jesus Christ, trusted in the Lord, uh, uh, the, the Father at that point. And then I said, if your answer is yes, there, uh, yeah, something could happen that will cause me to, to, to lose, lose my faith, then uh, you, the truth is you probably truly don't understand who Jesus is and what he has done in your life. And this is the purpose by which we are meeting this morning, is to unpack a bit of who is Jesus, so that we might have a better uh, picture in our minds about this. In fact, Paul Washer said this, whenever Christianity is attacked, the first place they attack is the deity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For 2,000 years the Christ of Christian history, and indeed world history, we have had to fight, that is, Christians have had to fight, we've had to amass arms, and we've had to do apologetics to defend the faith. We have had to do it all because uh, our purpose and our responsibility is to proclaim that Jesus Christ is God. Amen? He is God. But oftentimes, it gets lost in the melee of stuff that's going on around us, and we think Jesus doesn't fully or is incapable of doing anything powerful and miraculous to help us to get uh, over this hurdle. And so I want us to think, I want to help you to think that whenever you come to the study of Christology or who Jesus is, you must look at it in light of uh, of, Trini of uh, uh, Trinitarianly. You have to look at the, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. You can't just say Jesus is God and kind of ignore, but what about God the Father and what about God the Spirit? We have to keep it all in its, in its uh, appropriate uh, jurisdiction, and that is that Jesus is one of the uh, members of the Godhead. He is, he is the Son that uh, in the Godhead. And in that illustration that you see up top there, uh, we have these, this triangle, and I try to, uh, okay, we have this triangle that I've tried to uh, uh, help you to see that there is the Father, there's the Son, and there's the Holy Spirit, and He is transcendent, that He is holy other, He is distant, He is, he is distinct from all humanity. There is something about God that is nothing like you or me. Uh, this is the whole problem with uh, uh, Marvel Universe, you know. Marvel Universe is they, they try to, to bring God down to look like man, and so you have people like Thor and, and, and Vision and all other sorts of, because they want God to be so human-like. And we have to be clear that God is completely and utterly different than you or me. And in that Godhead, there is the Father. In that Godhead, there is the Son. And in that Godhead, there is the Holy Spirit. Now, I've had a, a line, this black line going across there, just to kind of show you that that line represents God in his, uh, in his state outside of time. That there is no time in which God uh, was created uh, or where God came along and, and, and kind of made himself uh, a part of humanity, you know, we're, we're, we're human and he is human and it's just like us. God is wholly other. And we never need to, we, we always need to remember that. He is distinct, he is fully distinct, and he is different from you or me. And that includes the Son, Jesus Christ. Now, there is a, there is a slide that's about the the next slide, is, is it there, the pre-existence? Okay, never mind. Okay, you can, you can cancel that now. Um, now, we're gonna talk about three things about God, okay? Three things about Jesus that draw him into God, that kind of point us to the fact that he is God. The pre-existence, the eternality of, of Jesus, and the nature of Jesus. We're gonna talk about these three ideas, and I need you 
uh, to join with me as we look at a couple of passages of scripture, hopefully to help bring clarity to that. Um, in John chapter 6 and verse 38, when we talk about the pre-existence of Jesus, we have this statement, for I have come down from heaven. Jesus makes that statement very plain, very clear in John chapter 6 and verse 38. Now, throughout the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, particularly, but also in John, these gospels are designed to teach us much about the fact that Jesus existed before he was a man. That before time, Jesus was always there. In fact, you will find that at least 10 times in those synoptic gospels, uh, uh, the phrase, I am come, is referred to well over 10 times. I am come. And what it means is that Jesus existed in heaven before time existed. He was a part of the Godhead, and intentionally and purposefully, he came to the earth. That's what it, it means. We could look at phrases like we've studied in the past, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. Do you think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophet or the prophets? And then he says, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them, suggesting that he was somewhere else. I came here with intentionality to do something about it. In Matthew 9 and verse 13, he uses the phrase, For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus came not to, just, not to call righteous or self-righteous people, but instead to call sinners uh, to himself. And we see this phrase, I have come, or I am come, repeated in Matthew 10, 34 and 35, Luke 12, 49 and 51. Uh, Luke 19 and 10, and Luke 13, uh, 19 and 13. That phrase is repeated over and over and over and over again. Jesus is saying of himself, I was somewhere, and then I came. I was not here, and then I came here. And by being not here, I mean he was outside of time. He was in that triangle up top, outside of time. We'll get to some other ideas in just a second. We look at John chapter 16 and verse 28. Jesus says, I came from the Father. He tells us plainly, where did I come from? I came from the Father. In, verse, in chapter 13 and verse uh, 3 of John, he says, and that he had come from God, and here's what, he, he's go and guess what, he's going back to God. Jesus says, I came from him, and I'm going to return to him. And in that illustration that we just had up the slide, and we see the, the triangle, the blue triangle at the top where God is, and I have a picture of his humiliation where he's coming down into earth, but there's a moment in time where he is exalted back to his, his position, rightful place in the heavenlies. Uh, you'll see that. And the whole point of this is to simply say this, that Jesus is saying to us through his word, throughout the gospels, uh, that he was somewhere else, and then with intentionality, he came to the world with purpose. He came into the world. In fact, looking at John chapter 6 and verse 38 one more time, what does it say? For I have come down from heaven, and then what does he say? Not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I came with a purpose. I came to fulfill that purpose. And I am going to fulfill that purpose because the purpose that I've come to fulfill is the purpose of God. I came from him. I am him. We'll see in just a second. In fact, it could be said of Jesus as it is said of the Father that Jesus is the uncaused cause. That he always was. In fact, it's better stated, he always is. He always is. Somebody, somebody, I guess it must have been a young person, because you know young people are very creative on their feet, must have asked Augustine uh, in the fourth century, Augustine, okay, who made God? And by the way, what was God up to before he created the universe? 
And Augustine, in his very can, uh, sharp mind and candor, says, son, God was making hell for people who ask such stupid questions. <laughs> I just can I can only imagine what that might have looked like at that moment. None of us were there. We're taking this, the word of God, and we're applying the word of God to what we understand, and we're saying, we weren't there. We weren't in the beginning. So who made God? That's, that's a, a non-answer, because God, being who he is, always is. You, he, the, he is God. He always is. Uh, and what was he doing? I wasn't there. I do believe that they were quite satisfied within themselves, I could argue that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit had great community with one another, and they were not in need of anything but to display their love, to display their creativity, to display the, uh, their, who they are, they created, they made, and they made us all as we are, individuals from all over the world, different races, different uh, hues of creation. It's amazing when you uh, yesterday I went swimming and I think I got bit by a rasp or some sort, one of those little fish that, um, that uh, just is so bold, just a little tiny little thing just comes and nips, nipped at me. And I'm thinking to myself, you silly fish. But as I was looking at it under the water and I said, it's a really, really beautiful fish. It's kind of like a rainbow uh, type of looking fish. It's really pretty. And you think, God made that. God made that. He just makes it all. And he enjoys showing that off to you and to me. So we could argue, John 6, verse 38, that Jesus existed before time. Not only that, we could argue that Jesus is eternal. Jesus is everlasting. Uh, open your Bibles to chapter 8 of John. Move over to chapter 8 of John in verse 58. John chapter 8 and verse 58, and Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now see, we read that, we read that so flippantly. What, what, what was Jesus meaning right at that very moment? What was he saying at this point? What was he trying to communicate? You know, when you look at the Gospel of John, there are at least seven times where, where Jesus says, I am, and it, we call them the I am statements of Jesus, and he says seven times at least, I am the door, I am the vine, I am the good shepherd. He says it at least seven times throughout uh, the book of John. But he qualifies the I am in this statement in chapter 8, verse 58, before Abraham was, I am. What? did he mean? What was he saying? A couple of things. Before Abraham was, I was. Now, you can't say that and diminish, Je and, and because that statement, I was, diminishes Jesus. It puts him in time, and it makes him less than Abraham, or, or it makes him as, as Abraham, as a man. And of course, that statement confused the, uh, the person's listening because they said, hey, you're only 30 years old. How is it that you could say, you, you, before Abraham was, I am? You're only 30. So that was a confusing, so you can't say was, because the idea of was is past tense, and it places somebody in time. But if Jesus is God and he is, where is he? outside of time. So what Jesus is saying is before Abraham, oh, sorry, Abraham lived his life out before me under my care because I am outside of time. Oh, Abraham, also he's meaning before Abraham was, I am present. In other words, he's saying as present as you see me before you now, Abraham, I was before Abraham. He lived his life out under my care. But the more, the more intentional idea of this passage is this. Abraham, before Abraham was, I am, the, 
grammatically correct way to say it or whatever is, before Abraham was, I is. Uh, or before Abraham was, I be. And the meaning of the, that phrase, I am, or I is, or I be, is I am self-existent. I, this is, I am here. There is no need to be created or made up or, or otherwise. I be who I be. And in fact, that phrase is a direct reference back to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, where Abraham said, whom shall I say is sending me? And God the Father said, I am that I am. Or I be who I be. Or I is who I is, is sending you. And they all knew it. This is God. This is God. In John chapter 8 and verse 59, see, after he made the statement in verse 58, I am, before it most Abraham was, I am, in verse 59, what did they do? They picked up stones. <laughs> they picked up stones to throw at him. They picked up stones to throw at him. In John chapter 10, and verse 31, it says that they, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. They picked up stones in chapter 31 of John 10, because chapter 30, uh, John 10, verse 30 said, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. So they knew immediately that that phrase, I am, was a, was a declaration, I am God. Jesus is saying, it is clear, I am God. I bear his name, I am who he is, and everything about me is who God is. Therefore, I'm eternal. But not only that, Jesus, the nature of Jesus, the personhood of Jesus, makes up who uh, uh, points us to the fact that Jesus is God. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. What a great passage of scripture to consider uh, when we think about this personhood of Jesus. But Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, he says, the, the Bible says, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by the by the word of his power D did you did you read that what what is he saying there what is he saying there look, look the first phrase he is the radiance of the glory of god radiance has to do with light glory has to do with the, the light, and the, even the word glory means weight, the weight of the light. So he's the radiance of the weight of God. He's the, he's the reflection of all that who, all who God is. That Jesus even declared in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light. So in other words, the light that emanates from the Father, when you see the light on the other side, what you see is Jesus. The light is Jesus. He actually said, I am the light. So when you see the glory of God piercing through, what you see is Jesus. He is the radiance. He is the light. Jesus displays all who God is. Not only that, it says, he is the exact imprint of his nature. The exact imprint. That is, he's the, the full and complete representation. He is the image bearer. He is the, he is the exact uh, replica. Replica is not a good word. Every English word pales in, in, to, to clarify this. Jesus is the exact imprint of God. John 10 and verse 30, he says, I and the Father are one. In chapter 14 of John, in verses 9 and 10, Jesus actually says, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. 
If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The personhood of God, the nature of God, he is the exact imprint of all who God the Father is. And not only that, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. I, I have to read Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. I know you all knew I was coming to that passage because it's very clear, isn't it? Uh, what's going on. I have to read verse 15 through 17. Listen carefully to these words and I'll try to do it as slowly as I can as I think about this idea of God upholding, Jesus upholding the universe by the word of his power. Look at verse 15 as it refers to Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities or things, uh, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and listen to this, and in him, all things hold together. Are you getting a picture that Jesus is God in the most amazing and I would dare say mysterious of ways? Jesus is God. There's a quote from Michael Ramsey, who is the former Archbishop of Canterbury, he made this statement. God is Christ-like, and in him is no unchrist-likeness. God is Christ-like, and in him, in God, there is no unchrist-likeness. To turn it around, Everything that we know about Jesus, the Christ, mirrors perfectly everything of who God is. You say, so what? what what's the point of all this? What is the point? Jesus is God. Just put those words together in that way. Jesus is God. Dear friends, this is the most amazing, mysterious miracle and wonder of all wonders. Last week I said the word became flesh. It, Jesus becomes flesh. I, want, I, I try to start by saying you can't think about Jesus and his parts without thinking about Jesus and his whole. He is God. So when we talk about Jesus, the Jesus that we understand as the Bible declares him, we are always, always, always thinking that he is God. That's our starting point. He's just not a man. He's not the man upstairs. And boy, do I does that bristle against me when somebody says, oh, the man upstairs, uh, he's my boy. He's, he's, he's the Don Juice. What? Jesus is God. So what does that mean for you and me? It simply means you break down and you worship. You break down humbly and you say he is God alone. And as God has the right to absolute demand over your life, you don't have the right to say, now listen here, Jesus. Who do you think you are? Who do I think I am? That I could turn around and just have words with him. 
Now, we're going to come to the humanity of Jesus later. I'm going to talk about the humanity of Jesus and that he allows us conversation, that he allows us to engage him. But I don't want you to miss it. Just because he allows us to have a conversation with him doesn't mean that he is me. He is God. And yet he invites me in to have a conversation with him. We'll talk about that later. But don't miss it. Jesus is a part of the triune God. He's the Father. And I, I even bristle when I use the, the phrase, he is a part. He's not a part. He is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not only is he God and therefore demands total uh, mastery over my life, Jesus Christ is God and therefore as such demands absolute worship because he is God. Demands our worship. Demands our recognition of him and who he is. This is who he is. And finally, to resist Jesus, to reject Jesus, is to resist God. And to reject God. Who do we think we are? I saw a phrase over a, 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 a poster board on Facebook a couple of weeks ago where somebody said, if, uh, if Jesus returns again, I want to crucify him again. I couldn't believe the audacity that some foolish person would say, yeah, let him come back because I want to kill him again. It is God you're messing with. It is God. You don't shake your fist in, in his face and say, I, I don't like you. I don't like what you've done. We're going to discover that this God in Christ caused us to repent by dying on that cross for our sins. We'll talk about it later. But I want you to get this idea that in Christ, God decided, God, God the Father, sometime in eternity past, certainly in the heavenlies, they were having a conversation. And they said, God the Father said, who will go for us? And Jesus volunteered and said, I will go. And, and I will become the sacrifice and the representative. I will go on behalf of the, the Godhead and represent us as we uh, die for the sin of man. Jesus declared that. And, and yet he's God. Now I know somebody's going to say, oh, so you're telling me that God is dead. God died. John 5 and verse 26 that says that in him is life. Jesus is the embodiment of life. So you can't kill God. But Jesus did die. What does that mean? We'll talk about that later when we come to uh, his death on the cross. But my point is simple. The pre-existent one, the eternal one, the one who bears the exact imprint of the nature of God being Jesus suffered for you. And yet each one of us at some point in our lives have had the audacity to say, how dare you? Who do you think you are? Jesus is God. Meditate on that. Marinate on that. Think on that. And then accept that he's invited you to worship him. He's invited you to surrender to him. He's invited you to receive him. For John 1 and verse 12 says, as many as received him, to those persons, he is given the right, the privilege, to become little sons of God, little daughters of God, children of God. Jesus is God, invites you to become his son. Will you do that today? Will you surrender to the king? Will you surrender to the deity? Father, we thank you so much for your love for us. 
thank you for this great grace that you've displayed in our lives. And now, Lord God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would transform us. Help us to really get a good glimpse of this, this deity, the, 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 the Godhood of Jesus, the divineness of Jesus. That he's not just a great prophet or a good man or a wonderful guy. He is perfection. He is absolute. He is the creator. And in him, all things hold together. Will you do something miraculous in our lives, Lord, that transforms our view of our own walk of faith? And we recognize that surrender to the king makes more sense. In Jesus' name, amen. Closing the blessing.
Have a great Sunday, everyone.